Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's Public Transport Information Coordination Group uh, meeting. Um, hopefully you've all had copies of the um, agenda and papers. Um, if we um, do some introductions because there are some new faces around the table. Um, so I'm Tim Rivett. I run Artig um, and I'm your chair um, stroke host for this afternoon. Um, now then, um, Teresa. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Hello, uh, Teresa, uh, note taker, stay silent types. There we are. I think that's enough for me. <laughs> OK, um, Amy. Hi, yeah, I'm Amy Brown, Open Data Platform Manager at Travel Line. Thank you. Um, Ian. Good afternoon, Ian Barrett, Lancashire County Council. Uh, Transport Coordination Group. Um, David. Hi, I'm David Fitzgerald. I'm Junior Product Owner for UK Bus. Ariba. Welcome. Um, I'm going down the order that they appear in the list, so they're slightly random. So we've got Rob next. Hello, Rob West, Illidium um, Building tools and services to help operators mainly large and small to um, get their BODS data in order and to try and drive up data quality. Oh, incidentally, before I disappear, I have to go at about three o'clock, so I'll have to catch up with the rest on the uh, video if it gets published later. Yeah. Thanks. It will. Yeah. John? Uh, John Carr representing the ATCO board today. Uh, John Austin. Hi, um, John Austin from Moby Hub Limited, uh, working at the moment on a project uh, funded by Foundation for Integrated Transport and um, with the support of the University of Plymouth and also Basemap to devise a methodology for um, working out where mobility hubs should go um, in the southwest of England. Um, so I'm working extensively on NAPTANs, so I have been with that. Sounds interesting. Um, Josh. Hi, uh, Josh Goodwin from BusTimes.org. Uh, Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Willis, React Accessibility. Um, we look at data really and also the uh, React IMRB audio trigger system. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Hi, good afternoon. Mark Jones, EPM product owner. Um, for EPM Group, so looking at the omnibus scheduling system and EPM performance reporting. Uh, Michael. Uh, Michael Milton, probably with a Wiltshire hat on today. <laughs> uh, Mike. Hi there, Mike Baxter from uh, Leicester City Council, Transport Development Officer. Um, responsibility for looking after the uh, the Leicester and Leicestershire Vic's real-time information system when we've got a, a big project um, uh, TCF funded for around 1,000 um, totems of which 650 are battery-powered real-time totems going around Leicester City mainly on inbound routes, uh, inbound stops mainly and, and high loading points. So that's a, a big project taking up a lot of my time at the moment. Mm. Excellent. Uh, Nick? You're on mute, Nick. <laughs> You're very good ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah. Got a gear. Got a gear. Um, Nick Carey from Wayfair. Uh Peter? Oh, Peter Stoner from the uh, Eto World. Uh, we well, particularly uh, working on consuming the BODS data, although we as a company um, have a lot to do with the maintenance of it and management of it, and also um, use data as being supplied to Google and Apple. Thank you. OK, um, Rebecca. 
I'm going to call family cursor then to take the mute off. Um, <laughs> Rebecca Rowe, I'm the uh, Service Information Manager at South Yorkshire MCA. Um, Richard. He was here a minute ago, but we've lost his picture. Oh. So. Hello, is that, is that me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Richard Hall, um, working with Peter at Ito World. Uh, previously, I worked at Northumberland County Council supplying data for Traveline and uh, NAPTAN and the National Public Transport Gazette here. Welcome. Um, Sarah? Hi, so I'm new here. I just started at the Department for Transport two months ago, so I'm head of data management here. And in, with regards to NAPTAN, I'm overseeing sort of data quality, <laughs> dare I say, um, and uh, the new NAPTAN, of course. And towards the latter end of this year, I'll take over as a product owner in its own right. Excellent. And um, we have apologies from Adrian. Falconer from the department who would uh, normally be here to uh, update us on NAPTAN. Um, I'll give an uh, update instead, just so you know. Excellent. Um, and um, Keith Sabin, who's uh, unable to uh, join us. Um, and I think that's all the apologies I've got and everybody that's here. Um, I'm just trying to we notes of the um, last meeting. Um, if we just do a quick run through for actions and anything wrong. Um, on um, NAPTAN related stuff on page three. Adrian was going to be talking to Voiré and Mark um, in Staffordshire. Um, I know they've had some conversations. Um, so hopefully that's resolved. Um, Triumph and Nick were going to have a conversation about um, data quality and data supply for ticket machines and things like that. Um, we haven't got Triumph on the call yet, but we've got Nick. Has that happened? It hasn't happened, sadly. Not quite sure why not. OK, so if we leave that on and yeah. um, perhaps we can have a chat, Nick, afterwards to sure. make sure that gets progressed. Then the next one was... Um, for John and Mira to have a conversation about journey planning, but we've got, we'll pick that up, I guess, um, when we come to um, journey planning on the agenda. Um, and the next action was about planning for today. So we'll pick that one up. So that was it for the actions. Um, is there anything on the minutes of the last meeting that people want to raise that you might think might not be covered? Yes, I have, uh, Tim. Yeah. Just that there was something about the journey planning system that um, Leicester City and Leicestershire County Council were were um, putting in, which I've, unfortunately I was. It, it said something about I was going to find out a bit more about that. I, it's something I'm only on the fringes of, but it, it, the, the name of the company that's actually providing the journey planning system is behind the scenes is Sked Go, not not whatever it says there. So it's S K E D, and then and then a capital G. So thank you, Mike. All right for that. Thank no you. problem. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else then um bus open data service i was expecting triumph yes triumph hello 
Hi. Um, hi, Tim. Hi. Um, apologies. Um, I was a little, little late uh, dealing with a, um, an impromptu personal um, situation. Um, just give me two minutes and I'll be with you. While Triumph's sorting himself out, um, recently um, Artig published um, a briefing note on how to provide data to BODS um, for the Queen's Jubilee um, in June. Um, so that was circulated to those on the PTIC distribution list um and um i believe went out um on gov notify to bods um users so you should have got that um that covers off the the move of um the spring bank from the monday to the thursday and how to um code uh, the additional friday bank holiday um and um, I think all of the um, scheduling system suppliers are uh, are okay with that and have got things in hand. Um, the bit that worries me most at the moment, and it has to be said, is is not that it's the um, all the little events that are going to be happening in um, local areas with short notice street closures and parades going on and things like that. Um, and the inevitable impact on bus routes and and how operators actually get to find out about those and um, be able to tweak routes and things like that. Um, so um, it's worth, um, if you're authorities, and there's a reasonable number of you are, um, working out how you're going to tell your operators that um, and keep them updated. But uh, if you have any problems uh, understanding the data coming out of BODS for the bank holidays or coding it up, please do feel free to get in touch um, and I'll uh, do my best to help sort things out. Uh, just there you go. Yeah, excellent. Can you see my slide now? We uh, can, yes. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Um, so um, I was going to uh, make a presentation on um, update to the boss of data service um, and summary of release of uh, 1.16.0. 1 1 um, so I will start with um, the find boards uh, browse page. Um, timetables and first data can now be searched by um, uh, not codes, operator names, uh, locations and descriptions in the browse data page of BODS. Um, AVL data can now be searched by um, operator names, uh, not codes and descriptions. Um, then uh, we've now given of uh, data consumers uh, an opportunity to um, sort of reach out to data publishers with the notice issues with this data page. Um, which helps of consumers who already logged on to both provide feedback uh, on on data to data publishers. Uh, users are now able to uh, directly contact operators. Um, you know, uh, can you know sort of contact you know data feed owner via data set detail pages, contacts via operator profile page, and there's also an option to contact um, anonymously. <laughs> Now, in terms of uh, operators' profiles, uh, users can search and filter through all operators registered on BODS. Um, they can access um, individual operator profile pages to provide details about the operators and their data on BODS. Um, that have access to APIs and browse, function, browse functions for data specifically. Um, now, in terms of our our desire to have increased data gathering on consumers. Um, there is 
now a login required to consume data. Um, that is uh, sort of downloading the data and using the API as opposed to just using the APIs as it was before. Um, and that would facilitate sort of uh, more information gathering um, um, at account creation. Then in terms of usability changes, there is a new guide me page. Um, there is an updated user interface. Uh, then there are information pop-ups explaining phrases to, to users of the system uh, to enable better understanding. Triumph, um, yes? I think you need to change your slide. We're still <laughs> seeing two oh. of three for the release. OK, oh, sorry, <laughs> just give us a minute. Um, Apologize to everyone. I'm having issues with um, the slide share. Is it okay if I just went through the slides like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for for your patience and understanding. Okay, so I suppose I'll go through this page again. Um, cause, um, so uh, I'll just quickly run through it. Um, in terms of operator profiles, users can now search and filter through um, all the operators registered on board. They can access individual operator profile pages um, and provide details about operators and their data on board. Um, they can access, they now have access to APIs and browse functions for uh, operator data specifically. Now, uh, like I said, um, there is an increased gathering of information on data consumers. So where hitherto um, users have been required to log in to consume API, they are now required to log in to consume both um, download data and the API. And this is to facilitate, you know, better information gathering um, at account creation to enable us to understand what people are using data, you know, using the data for the type of data they are using. Uh, this would then sort of feedback information to us to help us improve the system. Um, in terms of usability changes, there is a new guide me page. Um, there is an updated uh, user interface. And, you know, there are information pop-ups explaining phrases to users to enable them to sort of better understand and better use the system. Um, there have been fixes to issues with uh, of, uh, published bot open data users um, who we are encountering issues with sort of their bank holiday operations in time people's data that have been fixed. There has been the addition of uh, TFL data to the download all. Um, so enable, uh, enabling people to download sort of um, uh, TFL data. Um, admin users can now edit um, the agent organization feed for board users on the Django admin portal. Um, then, yeah, there have been some sort of patch releases. Then I would then move on to um, the data catalog. So uh, the improvements on the data catalog, catalog would provide users with comprehensive views of all data published on boards and provide matching information between different data sets. Um, so consumers can now download data catalogs by clicking the download data catalog link uh, on the boards guide me page. Um, the data catalog also includes uh, a user guide, uh, location data, operator not code, organization data, timetables data, and overall data. Um, this will provide users with a uh, comprehensive view of all data published on boards and provide matching information between data set types. Um, in terms of updates to, to the API, so registered consumers of boards will access uh, the API service through the Guide Me page and use new parameters of the location and first data API. Um, so users can now access API services through Guide Me page. Um, and, you know, these are sort of, um, you know, images illustrating how this would work. And if there's anyone who wants these slides, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to send them um, after, after this presentation. So um, there has been the addition of new query parameters um, of vehicle ref uh, to the AVL API. Uh, so the automatic vehicle location API, and um, 
there's also been a new query parameters of limit and offset to the Fed API. Now, in terms of updates to uh, the find Boss Open Data Service uh, browse page, uh, data consumers can now search for data set uh, uh, on the board's API. Um, if data ma if there is matching data, the result will be displayed. Otherwise, the existing result will continue to be displayed. So, um, timetables and fairs can now be searched by, as I have said before, not codes, operator name, locations, and descriptions in the browse data page. Um, AVL data can now also be searched by operator name, not codes, and descriptions. So this is where there has now been uh, the opportunity for people to report um, issues with data sets to data publishers. So there is a uh, there is now a notice issues with this data set where you know um, you can click on that and you can then sort of get in touch directly with uh, uh, data publishers with issues that you have noticed with uh, the data that have been published. Now, in terms of operator profiles, um, a view operator profile link has been added to the find uh, boss open data homepage, uh, which links it to a searchable list of operators who are registered with bots. This enables uh, uh, consumers to browse, sort and search through all operator registered on bots via the view operator profile link uh, that is now available on the find boss open data homepage. Um, consumers can now see the amount of data set um, available and how how compliant they are with BODS and how, how many of these data sets are compliant with BODS um, as per operator. Uh, they will be able to directly access uh, the operator's timetables, locations, and fares via, you know, via browsing or when signed in uh, or via the API feed uh, URL. Uh, consumers, when logged into BODS, would also be able to, uh, I have, I've gone through this before, contact operators uh, through the link, uh, and we also be able to do so anonymously. So where there was an opportunity for you to, um, or where there is an opportunity for you to contact the operator and, you know, let them know um, issues with the data, there is also an opportunity for you to do that anonymously, if for any reason you wanted to do it anonymously. Um, then um, there is a, a download all updates functionality, um, which will now allow users to download timetable data sets in uh, trans exchange format by region, um, enable them change the file structure of timetable time data zip to group files by operator folders, um, enable users to access downloads from all operator, operator profile pages. Um, and this has been introduced uh, via the download all link. Uh, well, this we've also introduced the down, download all link for uh, TFL zero VM uh, location data. Um, there have been sort of uh, changes to the bot user inter interface, which makes it easier for the users of find bot data, find bot open data service uh, in particular uh, to explore. Um, understand and use the data. So to facilitate this, there has been additions of uh, banners to pages uh, on the board, boards and published boards homepage that provide a summary of the service and a link to our Twitter account. And on the Find Boss Open Data homepage that provides a summary of the services and a prominent link to Guide Me, so the Guide Me page. Then they've also been updated to data set uh, uh, details pages to include more relevant information, guidance, uh, and links. Now, in terms of the overall user interface and user experience changes, um, there has been the addition of a, a clickable model pop-ups to the Find Boss Open Data uh, uh, service page that describes the different data formats, so Trans Exchange, DTFS, Siri VM, NetTech, um, on the browse and download all pages. Then uh, the concept of bond compliance and data quality checks on data sets and feeds um, are on detailed on the page. So 
this is an example of how this is illustrated on the page. And once, once again, if anybody wants the slide, I happily send this out to you, which would inform, you know, how you go about finding um, uh, these changes on the site. Now, in terms of the Guide Me page, uh, a Guide Me page has been added to the Find Boss Open Data Service, which can be accessed via the header uh, on every Find Boss Open Data page. So uh, users of the Find Boss Open Data Service will be able to access a comprehensive list of usage uh, guidance and functions descriptions with the appropriate links. Then consumer usage monitoring, like I have touched on before, uh, users must now sign in to consume data on board via the API or the download all feature. Um, account creation now gathers uh, the user's area of interest in terms of regional and national data. Um, during account creations, users uh, must log in their intended use as one of six categories are alongside a short text description of for more detail, they can also opt to be uh, contacted about usage. And this is just for us to understand how, uh, you know, the bots open data, better understand, I suppose, how the bots open data service is being used um, and how we can, you know, use this feedback to, to improve the system. So this is um, a rundown um, of uh, the recent changes that have been, changes and improvements that have been made to the service. Um, I will now entertain any questions. Anybody got any questions? Well, I see why you're called Triumph. It's incredible. Thank you. Um, I, I wouldn't take all the credit change. for it. <laughs> um, um, Go yeah. on. <laughs> um, a lot of colleagues have have worked hard yeah. to, uh, to make this to make this available. But yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a big release. It's great. And by the way, Nick, um, I, I am going to send send you an email. I apologise. Oh, haven't bless you. No, that. no, no, that's fine. We, we've all been phenomenally busy, but yeah, great, Trav. Thank you so much. Um, one, just a quick question from me, Triumph. You've mentioned several times that if people would like the slides, um, you can send them through. Will these be available so that we can make them accessible from the uh, on the PTIC website with links from the minutes it would help me but i don't know if that's doable um i would have a conversation with tim about that yeah. um, okay. um if, if yeah, you email the slides to me triumph then yeah. i'll circulate them and okay. stick them on the ptic site all right that works for me then i suppose that answers your question Teresa. Yeah, it was just whether you were okay with them being uh, made available uh, for everyone. That was all in terms of the mechanics. No, no, I have, no, I have no issues with, with them made, uh, being made available. Great. I think it's important we get, you know, as much information to about the release and, and the new features of the system. Um, I just didn't know how to go about doing that. Yeah, no, that. no, 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 no. As Master Tim will, will assist with such things, I'm sure. Uh, but really great. Um, actually, I've noticed the difference. The summary things actually actually haven't had to type much because the slides are really quite good in terms of the summary of where you're up to. There's a lot to take in, but um, it looks really good. One quick question I had though, you, there was some reference to being able to email operators through the system, either with your name or without your name, without going into too much detail. How does that work from the operator side? If they, if they got to access that through their account with bots, I mean, how's that going? Is that another thing they've got to deal with? Oh, well, just a general question, really, but yeah, yeah. So, um, so basically, how it works is, uh, or, or how it, I understand it works is, uh, uh mm, tell you what, I would bring up my emails and I would show you. So, once it goes to operators as an admin user, I get an email about it. So, um, if you give me a minute, I would just share how the email comes through from an admin and operator perspective. So let me just take this off and I'll, I'll bring oh, up one of the sure. emails. While Triumph's finding that, for, for those of you that, that use um, BODS, um, more and more operator data, particularly location data, is appearing, and the quality of timetable data is getting more, is getting it's getting better um, uh, as we move 
forward in time. So uh, it's, it's actually quite usable now. Um, and there's a number of people um, using it for, for live services now, I understand. So, uh, yeah, it's going it's going well. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. But this is this is how that information will be represented to the operators. Um, um, what the operator decides to do about that feedback, ultimately, at the moment, ultimately, their prerogative. Um, the intention is for them to, you know, obviously look into the data, look into the uh, to the feedback, and do something about it to correct the data. Uh, but in terms of how that is represented to operators, this is how it comes through. Yeah. So you see. Okay. okay. Yeah. It just. I mean, I'm sure you're in discussions with operators. Anyway, I see someone else has. Well, several people have got their hands up. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, it would be interesting to see because it's probably quite a coordination challenge for them. Uh, maybe some operators on the line that have got used to it. I don't know, but um, uh, it feels like a, a kind of another thing to deal with. Uh, so I was just wondering how that was going, really. But um, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose ongoing conversation. You know, um, you know, uh, as as far as how how we how we coordinate that going forward, and 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 how that is managed to ensure that it provides the, the value that we, we wanted to provide is still going, ongoing, so of both um, internally and with, you know, everybody that we feel um, is involved. Um, and, and I suspect, uh, and I suspect that, you know, um, yeah, it's something you'll be hearing uh, more about going forward, but uh, this is the feature and there will be always a continuous improvement to the system to ensure that it, you know, it provides the best value um, for all involved. Uh, Michael, um, you mentioned about the coverage is getting better on here, Tim. Any idea how many operators aren't on here still? Uh, Triumph, have you got any stats on that at the moment? I, I have some some stats somewhere. Um, not at the moment. Um, um, I'm not offhand. So um, can I take that as an action? Uh, and I would intend to get back to you, Michael. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Sarah? Hi there. Yeah, thanks very much for that triumph. It was really interesting. And um, I have another project at DFT, so we should catch up because there's some similarities here. Um, but <laughs> something I was just thinking about was um, I really liked the bit at the end where you, you had uh, sort of the engagement of you know are you happy for DFT to contact you to discuss how you're using the data and yeah. I think that was just a little bit of a different take in terms of the way that we'd done it is um, we were going to put a clause at the end to say if you've done anything interesting with the data would you like to contact us on so it's just the other way around I guess so uh, it'd be interesting to discuss that and and how you feel that works regardless of whether it's you know um, users getting in touch with us or you know how often we get in touch with them yeah yeah i i absolutely sarah um i think um yeah if if, if it's okay I, we, we can put something in the calendar and we can we can progress that conversation um, yeah absolutely thank you yeah no worries, sorry. Uh, okay um a final one from me um we were expecting some guidance on FAIRS data and how to put FAIRS data together. Um, I've not heard anything about that for um, a while. I don't know whether you've got an update. Um, no update at the moment, um, but it's something that um, we we hope to, to resume, um, resume work on and, and provide that update in the very near future. Um, the, a few things that have, you know, um, that have led to the delay, uh, but we are working on those and we should be with you very soon. OK, thank you. OK, um, is there any more on bots? Um, Tim, um, we don't have anything more on boards, um, but I think we could. Um, so we do have the, the, the latest reports from um, Transport Focus, so we could share those. Um, it really depends on timings in the agenda and where you've got whether you've got mm. time. Um, but certainly we've got um, the most recent reports from Transport Focus, if that would be of interest. Um, yeah, I mean, perhaps that's um, 
we, we probably are pushed for time. Um, but uh, if you send links through or copies, I can circulate them um, to to the group. Lovely, thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, um, in which case then, um, if we um, move on to NAPTAN, um, Sarah's got an update for us um, on that. Sure, so I'm just passing on the messages, so I apologise. I've not got any slides or um, any fancy display at the moment, but just as an update as to where we are and what we've been doing. Um, so we've obviously, um, well, I don't know if it's that obvious, but we've moved from the old system to the new system and that, that's now live and we've actually inputted new data into the new system. So that's all a go and everything's going fine with that. Um, so a first entry of data was uh, TFL data and that went in two weeks ago now and there's some more edits to be made to that data as well. Um, also, um, we've held um, a meeting to discuss longitude and latitude. So um, I'm sure maybe you're more aware than I am about the fact that, um, you know, there used to be some sort of updating of longitude and latitude in the system and that that functionality has been withdrawn in new NAPTAN. So there's still some ongoing discussions about that um, and where we where we should go with it, really. Um, and I think in, in terms of the discussion here, I just thought we would flag it as well um, and the fact that if we were to do it in-house, for example, um, we take in Eastings and Northings and we might take obviously longitude and latitude if it's given to us, but we would have one uh, yeah. one, one main way of conversion. And so we would then o either overwrite if, if there was a change in longitude and latitude or, you know, provide a longitude and latitude where it wasn't present before. Um, so I just wanted to flag that this might mean overwriting some of the local authorities' data, um, but also I'd like opinions in this meeting, if there is any, um, before we do make a decision on this. We haven't decided fully on that point. Um, the last point was that we um, we had a public meeting about um, bus stops. And so bus stop location was decided that the actual location of bus stop would be where the customer got on board the bus. There was many discussions as to whether it should be where the pole is, where the tree is, where the 10 meter area is for a bus stop. So yeah, the bus stop location as decided um, by um, Chorus as the place where a customer, customer gets on the, on the bus. And also we decided that it should be within one meter squared accuracy as well. Um, yeah, and the next thing to just highlight is um, going forward now, we've just started to work on the upload function and we're going to be putting together a group of local authorities to test a new upload service um, before we go out to a wider audience in the coming months. Um, we might be aiming for sort of May or June, so mid-summer for this. Um, I'm sort of keen to let you know that this will be coming in local authorities as well. Um, so that's the update from ourselves here at NAPTAN. Um, just going back to the question regarding longitude and latitude without sparking a debate in terms of how you feel about that and how we feel about, you know, maybe possibly overwriting some local authorities' data. And if anyone's aware of kind of, I guess, how, how you obtain the longitude and latitude and, and if you're more happy with it, have been populated a different way and, you know, might cause disruption if we were to overwrite it, for example. Mike, you've had your hand up for a while. Um, yeah, apologies if uh, I probably should know this, but I've not been keeping on top of uh, all the nap time changes as perhaps as much as uh, some people because I just haven't had the time. But in terms of this longitude and latitude, I'm just wondering what, why is it been withdrawn from? Is it to do with sort of conversion errors or um, because I, I'll give you because I'm doing lots of work on sort of surveying and stuff, it's really useful just to kind of like download. I've got some old downloads in NAPTAN, and if you've ju just got it in a spreadsheet, you can just put a link to Google Maps and go straight to where the stop is and look on Street View, etc., with the latitude longitude. Um, and that's really handy because I think Google Maps works on latitude longitude, not eastings northings. So taking that out is a bit of a problem. I, I, I'm sure it's probably been explained, but so um, just for my benefit. Yes, it's, it's um, quick. Sorry. Yeah, it was it was because there was quite a lot of errors with it and people were doing it in different ways. Um, so achieving different results and then they would be slightly out. So it became a bit of a data quality issue um, and the accuracy of the data. And then also not everyone would pr provide longitude and latitude. So um, at the moment, the new, the new features present, we don't have a conversion. And this is why we're trying to make a sort of come to a consensus on whether 
we do actually, you know, create longitude and latitude from Eastings and Northings and, and then populate that on top of the data. And if we calculate it a certain way, or oh, somewhat local authority is going to be upset that we overwrite their data because they've done it in a different way. Um, so yeah, this is a discussion that's going on. I think we've started to move towards the fact that we will provide longitude and latitude. It's just that obviously we provide the data as is. So if you have Eastings and Northings and that's the way the data is, um, you can then convert to long, longitude and latitude later on. And for example, like with Google, that, that's what they, they do obviously, or when they take the data, that's what they're doing. So we just need to, to look at the use for it really and um, where things are going wrong and where the errors are coming in. Okay, right. Yeah, I, I, I certainly support I'm sure well, you do. Put it, yeah, yeah, putting yeah. it in. I, I, know. I know, and when it comes to location of where the stop is, it, it's something we're doing. We're, we're putting these totem things in suitable locations, which may not be exactly where you get on the bus. It all yeah. depends on where shelters are, and and Naptan is full of errors. Certainly in in Leicester, you, you look in the stops hundred yards down the street, but, but we know that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. I'll update you as soon as we know more as well. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, uh, Nick. I understand the data quality issue, but uh, but I would argue that um, uh, the um, the easting northing route is uh, you know uh, very centred on UK. It's not what the rest of the world does, um, okay. and it's semi proprietary because is it not based on Ordnance Survey data, which of course the civil service have wonderful access to, but the rest of us don't unless we pay money. Um, <laughs> So it's a bit proprietary. I don't know how we overcome that. OK, yes, um, like I say, it's something we do. We're still discovering, you know, the use for it and how people are utilising it and what the changes, what, what the changes would mean if we if we weren't to provide it. Um, so I guess, you know, I'm new to the world of this data just as a means of a background to myself. I, I've worked in health data for 12 years prior to this. So, you know, transport data is new to me um, and understanding this this world. Um, so in terms of what you just said about um, longitude and latitude being something that, you know, other countries use, I guess, not not you know, not just ourselves, is something that, um, yeah, I've noted down on something we'll be discussing. Okay. Mm. Um, Amy. Hi, yeah, um, just as a, I know the consumer just to, echo our kind of support for putting that back in that was one of the main um you know transitioning to the new nap time that was one of the main things we had issues with was having to work out a way ourselves to put all those back in where they've been removed and then obviously you've, you know you've got the worry that are we doing that in a different way to other people and and you know if that's something that's coming from the source um from nap and then, then that would be a a preference for us and but yeah, just to add sure. my support for it to come to come back in if that is if that is an option and to to keep us Thank in the you. loop of, of what would be happening with that because that's a yeah that's one of the main things that we've been kind of struggling on for. in the transition <laughs> so yeah, yeah cool yeah. thank you no worries I've noted that and yeah as soon as we know anything we'll be publishing some information about it okay. thank you okay any more questions any more views on Lat long, easting northings. John, was that your hand? Yeah, um, <coughs> a, a, a rather more practical question, as it were, practical in terms of uh, as people see it on the streets. Uh, the practice of where a bus actually stops, of course, varies with operator. For example, in London, they stop by the pole or instructed to stop by the pole. Um, in other parts of the country, they're instructed to start uh, to stop um, by the end of the bus box, which is actually the most efficient way of uh, making use of curb space. Um, as you're unlikely to get rid of these um, cultural practices, have we got sufficient um, flexibility within the NAPTAN system to uh, to accommodate this and in the information we pass on to the public? Sure. Um, I mean, that's something I need to go back on. But in terms of, you know, 
the survey that we did and the public meeting and people, you know, noting that was all noted, like you say, different areas have different stop rules. Um, but I think because like different bus stops, you know, like even the hail and ride bus stops were mentioned, you know, and, and how they're so different to others as well, um, that to come to a consensus of where things were similar or there was a similarity that's why we've ended up going for where the pedestrian sort of flags down a bus because it changes so so significantly between you know a bus pole and the end of a bus stop if it were to be a few meters long and um so yeah i think it's, it's looking at the implications of that but i guess that putting the data into naptan um is a physical bus stop isn't it it's where it's where someone's even put the pole or the stop and that's why we've gone for this one meter squared sort of um area because we believe that you know, within that one meter squared, it gives leeway for it being either a bus stop or the bus stop and at the end of the bus stop. Not 100% accurate, obviously, um, but it's to avoid such a large area versus, you know, a, a pinnable area of where that would be occurring. Yeah, if I can raise another yeah. general sort of point, I, uh, the accuracy of nap time has been an issue <laughs> ever since I was in short trousers almost. Um, <laughs> Well, not quite, uh, but um, <laughs> what I do observe in uh, a state of retirement going around and visiting operators and authorities in different parts of the country is that many bus stops are now in not terribly useful locations for the people that are using them. Now, I know there are resource questions here, but shouldn't we actually at a time when we're trying to fulfil national bus strategy aspirations, be looking to ensure that bus stops are well positioned. Now, I know that's not something that concerns us particularly as PTIC, but yeah. it is something that I think we've got to have the flexibility to respond to. OK, I mean, I'm, all, I'm unaware here if there's any sort of forum that this type of thing can be taken to um at all in terms of discussing bus stop locations um obviously within naptan like say it's just, it is where the bus stop is placed so by that point the decision's been yeah. made i guess yeah is anyone here able to maybe chip in on that or or maybe yourself if you're aware john i think it again it varies around the country um my own experience was largely that like it or like it not the uh, the real determinant was the police, because if you were looking at a bus stop location, the police, the highways authority and the PTE in my case would meet and the police would generally have the, the veto, as it were, in terms of their perception of road safety. Uh, the other thing to say is that there are other parts of the country that I'm aware of, whether they're still sticking to the fabled uh, whatever it is in um, metric terms 250 meters walking distance is it um, and their bus stops are positioned that far apart whether or not there's an identifiable traffic objective nearby and this is because it's one of the reasons why I suggest there's there's going to be a need at some stage if we're going to achieve the model shift we want of having a wholesale review of bus stops but again, sure. it, it's just really to flag up that whatever we do now, NapTown should have the flexibility to be able to move fairly quickly as mm -hmm. people review things. Yes, if it, I see what you mean. There might be like a raft of changes, for example, after some discussions on bus stop locations. Yeah. Thank you. OK, Ian. Yeah, afternoon. Unfortunately, I was I was part of that huge discussion about where bus stops are located, where the actual <laughs> bus stops are, and it went on for two uh, hours or more. <laughs> it did. And in all honesty, it's when there was people talking about the different systems that are available. Realistically, it's the downstream systems that are going to have to make some tolerances. We had one operator saying their software actually made the journey they were planning for the bus to go up on the pavement to actually hit the stop to then get back to the middle of the road. And the suggestion was that the bus stop was in the road for his system. Mm. Well, that's crazy to say the least. But as you know, anybody who ever lived in Manchester, you go and try and catch the 192. They came that frequently. There was no way that a, the bus could actually hit the stop. And we had a 
a dude from DFT who was saying, well, we've got to be aware of those with accessibility needs, those with partially sighted, uh, and they'll be using an app where they were trying to actually access the bus. Well, again, to me, it's got to be the downstream systems that are going to have to put some tolerances in to make take account of that. It can't just fall on Napsan or the local authority managing mm -hmm. that or owning that because they're going to actually put the stop where they've got the flag or where the shelter is because they might not even have a flag on the shelter because yes. there isn't a standard for actually saying what is at a stop. So all I can say is I've probably mentioned it, if this is not the fourth time, the tolerances <laughs> need to be in downstream systems in order to make this work. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know it was a very, it was an enlightening chat for me. That was one of my first sort of public meetings as well, understanding, you know, this new world of transport data compared to health and, uh, you know, two, two and a half hours talking about bus stops and how there's many different locations of bus stops. It was it was very enlightening um, and made me see the many issues that we would have here as well. <laughs> you can't believe the passion that people have over the bus stops. It was amazing. It was it amazing. Was phenomenal. <laughs> actually placing it and it does hit on another bit of a point that uh, John was making is the fact within the BARD system if there's a NAPTAN missing they can create a NAPTAN and there's not going to actually be a bus stop there then it gets down to a safety issue if they're stood there does that make it actually a stop because somebody's put yes. it in the data even though it doesn't exist there's an awful lot of other issues that haven't been addressed with NAPTAN linking with BODs and this creation of stops so anyway we'll just put it out there Thanks for that. I'll note that. Thank you. I was once actually told I'd have blood on my hands if I insisted on putting a bus stop and shelter where I wanted it to go. <laughs> <laughs> but that, of course, was more in terms of the, the planning aspect of the property it was in front of. Uh, we, the way I used to do it, John, is we used to walk, get a, a meeting together and all the households who were there, we had a discussion and whoever wasn't there, that is where the stop went in front of their house. So, yeah, you know, we, we, done that too. Yeah, how, how times have changed. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, is there any more on that, Tan? No. OK, excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so last time um, we um, heard from uh, John Carr um, about a fateful journey that he was trying to get from um, a vaccination centre to a football match, the two most important things in some people's lives. Um, I think at that time. <laughs> Um, and uh, and the struggles you had with journey planners, um, and we had a good um, healthy debate about it. Um, and so, um, John, you're going to update us on where your thinking has got to, and the conversations with Transport Focus and others, I guess. Uh, well, since then, uh, there've been more unfortunate encounters with with journey planners. Um, and in some of these cases, it's a case of how accurately the data is entered, obviously. Um, some of this has been in terms of disruption, particularly in London. Um, but there are a number of points that are coming out. Mira and I haven't really had much of an opportunity, and this is down to me because I've had a computer meltdown and uh, family illnesses to cope with. But um, uh, it appears to me that maybe, and there's an echo of the previous discussion here, maybe what would be useful would be if ATCO were to convene a round table for an hour or so to just look at what people felt the public really wants. And I, I emphasise the public as opposed to us with bees in our bonnets, um, really wants from uh, journey planners and we know that the work that um, uh, transport focus has done has given us a lot of useful information on that particularly the travel line work uh, so that's that's what i'd um that's what i'd propose but i just pushed that open for uh, a proposal that i'm prepared to take away in action if people think, think it would be a good thing comments um. thoughts yeah, I think yeah, that's a fair idea. No, I think that'd be a great thing. Yeah. 
I mean, one of the things that we'd really like to see is um, journey planners increasingly providing information about activity levels. Um, so, so for example, we talked to Google about the inclusion of steps data in um, multimodal journey plans, and then similarly, um, <clears throat> and emissions data as well. So, yeah, I think that yeah, it makes absolute sense. We, we we were also talking about what the role of the department may be or may not be. And again, my view is coming back from the rather hardline view that there should be a mandatory set of rules and every journey planner should be required to, to meet that, uh, rather as we would do for a hardware-based system, for example. Uh, but I think this is a, a, an excellent um, area to publish a good practice guide, but also to encourage, as Mira was just suggesting, the developers of journey planners to go that bit further and give that much more information. You know, a good example of that sort of thing was when um, Unilink in Southampton put on their website when people were doing journey plans, they put a photograph up of the surroundings of the stop that uh, they were in, and that, that was many years ago. John Austin will remember that. Yeah, it sounds like a sensible idea to, to get a group together to uh, to discuss it. If you're happy, John, to coordinate dates with me, then we can make sure that it yeah. gets wide circulation and we can have a um an atco ptic session um it would be really good if we can make sure we get people like transport focus and um travel line and, and people that actually have got that cust that link to the customer um i think that's the yeah and and and, and passengers seem to be doing quite a lot at the moment as well yes yes yeah, yeah. So I'm okay. sure Tom would be. Uh, happy yes, to I was just going to say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So if we yeah, take sorry, to Dar it's Dar Darcy here from Passenger. Um, yeah, I agree. We'll be de delighted to um, help out on that, of course. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there's an action there to take things forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, travel line projects. Um, Julie, um, not with us um, today. Um, I should have given her apologies. Actually, um, from a project point of view, she says that um, um, th there's a number of projects in the pipeline, but she's waiting for funding and approvals to progress so there's nothing from sort of that project perspective she wanted to update us um with but i don't know whether there's anything you want to raise amy with your data hat um no i don't think we've got any significant updates at the moment everything's kind of as it has been in the last meeting probably with our you know working on um, you know, working out how to consume data from pods. Um, and I know Julie's working on uh, a lot of plus plus things that are kind of in the pipeline at the moment as well. So, um, yeah, I think just sit tight for the moment and hopefully might be able to put out a, uh, a new stakeholder briefing at, at some point with kind of updates about our position and where we're at with everything. But um, otherwise, I don't think we've got any kind of new uh, new things to raise okay thank you mike hi yeah i'm sorry i've got a question about travel line and um, apologies if i'm showing my ignorance again um basically i've had a question from one of my colleagues at leicestershire county council um they they also sort of contribute towards the the vix real-time system in leicester and leicestershire but he he's basically saying that do we I believe he gets some kind of a subscription fee from travel line for a next bus connection. Now, next bus is a very ancient. 
uh, application interface, isn't it? Or web browser thing and mobile. It should, do 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 we actually have to pay to provide data to Travelline for its next bus service? Yes. Um because because uh, 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 forgive uh, I'm perhaps showing my naivety. I thought the people that I would have thought that that um, the consumers of the data feed would pay for it rather than the the providers. Yeah, well, it's kind of uh, from both directions, I think, because there's the well, there's the next bus. Next bus is API, um, which is the open data that. The consumers of that open data will pay um, at cost for, and um, that is also the thing that's on the you know the kind of very old-fashioned clunky nextbuses dot maybe website that you mentioned, and also yeah. feeds our um, live time section on the travel and info page and the um, SMS service. So um, yeah, there's the cost. Uh, for the open data to the consumers, but then also the feeds. Um, so you, like all, you, the, all the feeds you, that are on it, if if a local authority wanted their feed to be available to those open data users on next buses, then they're um, paying a subscription fee to have their real time as a part of that system. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be. It's not. You know, it's not that we have all the feeds from everyone. All over kind of thing. It's uh... okay because I have I have I've looked in Leicester on, on the or look on the travel line website and I can see real times for Leicester buses. You know, yeah. for, uh, say first Arriva and Centre bus, and that will be coming from our Vic system. Yeah. So we're obviously so we have to pay a subscription to pay to send that to you guys. Yeah, I th I think the it's it might have come about more recently as it's kind of something that they've been aware of because I think in the past um it's maybe been paid for as part of the um right okay. southeast and east Anglia and east midlands uh consortium sort of thing that's now being wound up and I think they we charge yeah. them and they sort of they I'm not sure what those sort of uh, membership it, to that just, was but now it's being paid directly instead is it something you could provide me with a bit of info on outside of this meeting? Just yeah, yeah, email sure. confirming how it works, and then I can go back to this guy. He's, he's mentioned David Dyson. Is it David Dyson? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think, it, yeah, I think before there was kind of a maybe a bit of a middle part between the local it, authorities it and travel like it, yeah. with, with but, the kind of regional yeah, organisation. Yeah. But now I don't want to monopolize yeah. this meeting with this query. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you could just if you could take an action just to send me some info on that, and then I can. I can confirm it with him. Thank you very yep. much. Yep. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there's no more on travel line, um, content management system to electronic display interface. Um, we talked about this um, last time, um, but since we met in December, the, the work on that has uh, progressed. Um, so um, Transport for Wales um, kicked this off with Arctic originally. Um, they were wanting to get to the point where they could buy a display off a catalogue and plug it into a um, common content management system. So the, the system that provides the information to to display to to push out to displays um it would allow them to have a single place to put messages in and it would appear on any display um in their network um so from that original concept um that's now been um taken to the point of a published version 1 um of the architecture um so how the messages to displays move around um, and also the core messages that are needed to support a um, basic text display. So if you think about um, a three line LED, um, the, the messages um, that are needed to um, 
support the operation of something like that. You can, of course, use those same messages to to display on a TFT and things like that, because um, fundamentally what gets displayed on a TFT in terms of bus times um, is, is the same information that you would put on an LED. Um, the next phase of work, um, having got those fundamentals in place, um, is to um, support um, graphical displays um, and sort out um, fault management messages um, and a whole host of other optional things that you might have on a display, for example, text to speech for audio announcements. Um, you might you know, have a air quality sensor and, and things like that. So um, there's, there's a roadmap for developing the next um, set bits of uh, bits of data. Um, anybody got any questions on that work? Yeah, I've got, um, I've got no one. Sorry, you go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say no questions for me. Just uh, I think it's a really um, valuable piece of work and um, great that you're um, pushing that forward. Thank you. Sorry, I would only say that you, you, you've only mentioned there in passing that text to speech is an option, but um, globally, audio really shouldn't be an option for displays. As the DOT says, you know, you should be providing visual and audio information at bus stops where possible. So it's not a, an, an extra thing, so to speak, I would say for the specification, but that's all. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Uh, just just to come in on what Keith has just said, we as as part of our um, RTI battery totems that we're rolling out across Leicester, they they all have text to speech. So that's um, good news for for Keith, uh, hopefully, and ev everyone with a visual uh, in need to 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 um, hit the stop stop announcement and the departures. Um, just a quick question, um, Tim, about is this something related to the Arctic event on the 23rd? I know it's slightly going out. Uh, we will be talking about it yeah. on the 23rd, yes. OK, OK. Is that is that a meeting you one can attend without being an Arctic member or not? Um, you can. There's a small charge for non-members. Right, OK. But uh, sure. let's, let's talk about it, Mike, if, if you're interested yeah. in coming okay. along. OK, so I, I believe one of our, our supplier is going along. Uh, Yes, of our battery totem. So yeah, so yeah. that's the reason I'm I'm asking that. So sorry to slightly deviate again. I do do have a habit of doing that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Leading on your point there, Mike. It's it's good that all displays have got obviously got um audio or text to speech, whatever it is. But um there's, there's a bot, isn't there? advantages against obviously uh, push button versus obviously the React system where a blind person actually got to find something to push as well. Obviously, that's one of the things people do find difficult if you've got to find the stop to push the button. Whereas the React system, obviously, from my perspective, is um, automatic in that sense, and they can get it through the app or, or key fob, which is the increased benefit of that. Right. Yeah. Okay. I I I I wasn't involved in the actual decision as to what what solution we went for in terms of why we went for the push button as opposed to the React system, but. Um, yeah, I, I can see your point, but yeah, it, 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 it is located so that it's it, it's easily accessible even for someone in a wheelchair. So hopefully that will go some way towards. Um, yeah. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, locating you, shall we say. It's just another consideration for obviously talking yeah. about for what people want in journey planning, what they want at bus stops. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Cheers. OK, um, so having got this um, standard, the next thing um, is implementation. Um, it's 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 relatively easy to um, write the standard, although Rob, who's done much of the technical work, might disagree. Um, once you've got the document, um, you know, and, and the standard, it needs to be um, implemented. And so um, one of the other things that we're now um, 
looking to do is to make sure it gets into um, people's requirements. Um, it's going to obviously be included in the Transport for Wales um, tender, which is coming out um, in the next uh, couple of months. Um, it's already been included in one tender that's 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 out and um, in evaluation. Um, if you are tendering for displays and content management systems, then uh, I would encourage you to uh, to include it um, because it opens things up and allows a lot more flexibility than uh, than you might otherwise have. So um, it is publicly available. You don't have to be an Arctic member to get it. Um, by the way, okay. Um, any more on content management system stuff? No. Okay. Um, next, um, Artig publications. Um, so um, there's quite a lot that's been going on um, in Artig over the last few months um, and a lot of stuff going on um, over the next couple of months. Um, so um, I thought these would be of interest to the group. Whilst it's not standard related, um, low bridge strikes and be vehicles um, hitting them um, is a real big problem, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, it's it's less of a problem for buses than lorries, but um, you do still see in the news with alarming regularity. Um, a bus having hit um, a bridge. So there's a report that's uh, openly available going through best practice, good practice on, on how to plan routes to avoid bridges, as well as some technology that might help and assist um, in, in avoiding them. Um, so um, particularly if you're um, an operator or involved in planning routes, it's worth grabbing a copy of that and having a look. Um, in preparation for the accessible information regulations that are due this year, um, there's a report on audiovisual equipment on bus. Um, so next stop announcements um, covers off um uh, best practice in um announcements and messages and things like that as well as covering some of the different technologies um for both displays and audio um and uh talks about some of the things that if you're going to put it on vehicle you want to be thinking about from an installation and maintenance um perspective um there's also um this is a members only report but happy to talk to people if you're not a member and want to copy passenger counting um and occupancy information a big topic um a lot of work was done um during the pandemic to put in place ticket machine based solutions but there's a whole host of other ways of counting um, passengers and getting to occupancy and so this report covers off um, use cases and, and how you might develop a business case as well as the different technologies involved. Um, then um, we um, ran a session and have produced a report off the back of that looking at how you can better manage customer information when you've got driver shortages and yes this was a uh, done at a particular time when there was an awful lot of um shortages not just because there's not enough drivers but drivers were going off um and having to isolate with covid and things like that there's quite a lot of lessons that are more general from it um about managing short notice changes cancellations um, and messages um, and there's some actions that are in there that we're picking up 
some of which I suspect will come to this group at some point for looking at. Um, we've talked about the CMS to bid protocol. We've talked about the Jubilee document. Um, and we've got a number of events happening over the next few months. Um, already touched briefly on one in Birmingham, our first face to face in two years, um, looking at innovation and displays. So there's going to be um, suppliers of displays there um, with some physical displays, and they're going to talk about um, their latest, greatest offerings. But we're also going to talk about um, the um, CMS to display interface, um, some work that we'll be releasing in the next few weeks on um, environmental impact of displays and how you um, manage displays um, and things like solar and um, um, long-term maintenance and, and, and end-of-life type stuff from cra cradle-to-grave life of displays and how to minimise the impact of that. Um, then um, in April, we've got a session on low bridge strikes um, and one for uh, looking at the the technology behind the display interface, which is something called MQTT, something new for the UK really, but quite widespread use in um, transport on the continent and things like that. Um, and then um, a session in May on traffic, on bus priority um, for traffic lights, um, something we've covered um, before. Um, small charges for the last couple of those, but ha always happy to talk to people um, if you're interested in those. Those are the ones that we've got planned at the moment. There will be ones that fit in in the middle of those um, as we uh, identify needs to cover topics. Has anybody got any questions on any of those? It's a lot of good stuff if you're into technology and standards and best practice there. And um, we just wanted to say thanks, Tim, for the work that you did with the local authorities in December um, on um, the prediction service. And yeah, just to say that, um, yeah, we, we thought that session was really well attended and the, 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 the important feedback that we got from you following the, the session was really useful and has really helped shape our thinking. Um, so yeah, it's just really to say yeah, thanks um, for the work that you do, um, and that it does really make a difference. Thank you, Mira. Um, any more on Artig? No. Okay. Um, then um, EU standards. Um, Siri um, chugs along um, and version 2.1 gets closer to release. Um, unfortunately, um, SEN, um, European Standards Body that releases it, um, has, has certainly consumed too much treacle um, over Christmas and has ground to a halt. Um, and uh, having been hopeful that it was going to be um, uh, published um, in January. I'm not sure it's going to be done before the end of this year now. Um, there are things that, that were imminently going to be published last summer that now only just look like they might be published in the next couple of months. Um, so they've, they've got real problems there. Um, but the schema is available on GitHub if you need um, some the the draft documentation because you're going to be implementing some of it particularly thinking about some of the disruption stuff and um occupancy improvements in there then let me know um i did do a webinar last year on the changes um which is on uh, the artig uh, youtube channel if you want to find out what those 
changes are and, and what you might find interesting in there. Um, then the probably the um, the most interesting bits for this group. Um, there's going to be some work starting very soon um, next month um, on um, control systems um, and um, control actions. So what happens when um, there's a disruption or you need to swap out a driver? Um, that's not particularly well supported um, in Siri. Um, and so um, looking at how we can um, support that um, sort of thing. Um, and probably the the the, the real big interesting stuff that's that's going on that's going to have a the biggest immediate well medium term impact on on what we might want to look at in this group and some of the things that we've been talking about um is accessibility um so um european commission um has been really hot on accessibility um over the last few years um and so there's work going on to create um, a profile for NetEx for accessibility data. So you've got NetEx, which covers all sorts of things to do with planning of public transport services. Um, and if you leave it to people to choose how to implement, um, you know, people go off in different directions. So you create a profile that like we've got for trans exchange for bods, for example, um, excuse me, that, that narrows that down and says this is exactly how you need to do data for people to understand. Um, there's some work going on to, to really narrow that down for, um, for NetEx with accessibility um, that will get to the point where Hopefully, people have got the data available for journey planners, so you can go, I have this particular mobility need, or um, I have a cognitive impairment that means the um, changes are really difficult for me, um, or I don't like buses, but I'm okay with trams, um, and covers things like um, you know, I can cope with two or three steps, but not a flight of stairs. I can cope with an escalator um, or I can only use a lift um, type thing. So to, to really refine that sort of information down to help journey planning. Um, so there's a lot of work going on with that. Um, and whilst that's tied to European legislation, um, and we won't be subject to it. Um, it's going to be really useful for us as a country to to take that and think about accessibility and what data we might need at bus stops and on vehicle um, to support um, improvements in accessibility for public transport. Um, I would think that that should be completed um, this year, um, probably about halfway through the documentation at the moment. Um, so has anybody got any questions on that or European data standards? No. OK, um, Triumph. Did I see your hand go up? Yeah, so it was a it was a temporary hand. I just um, I had a thought there for a minute. So um, I was just wondering, you know, in terms of European standards, when, you know, as European laws do not apply to us, what happens when these standards have been 
articulated, um, how does that then? I, I just wanted to understand what what happens here in the UK, because for us, accessibility data is you know, and I had a conversation with you about this not not very long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but once that those standards have been articulated and have been enshrined in law, how? What then? How do we then move them forward here in the UK? Just to understand that process, does that does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think there's two aspects to it. One is the technical standards. So the work to produce something like Siri or NetX is technical. They're published whilst they're done under the auspices of CEN, which is the European wide standards body. Um, they're actually published by each country's national standards body. So in the UK, that's the um, British Standards British Standards Institute, um, and it is the UK's um, practice to take send standards and um, automatically. Um, turn them into um, BS standards um, and publish them unless there's a good reason not to. Um, so from a technical point of view, um, up new versions of Siri and NetX and things like that um, automatically become British standards. Um, from a legislation point of view, because some of these standards are created to support um eu um legislation um then that's entirely up to the uh you either uk if it's a uk wide thing or if transport being that it's devolved it would be down to each of the um constituent parts to uh to to consider whether they want to do something um but there's no automatic um, thing that happens there. Does that make sense, Triumph? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. So, so sorry, Tim, with, with um, mental accessibility then, who actually gets the mandate that councils have to do something? Or are you saying they don't and it will never get done? Or is it something the DFT say it has to happen? And I suppose, is that, something which the DFT are looking at when they look at the future of NetChat and how accessibility crosses over? Or is it just, I, I don't follow the who says do what? Yeah, right. so so once it's once it's a British a BS whatever standard, then um, implementing it is either whoever's buying or specifying the product you know, so if you're, you know, a can of paint has to meet certain safety standards. If you're buying it, then you specify that. Um, but for something like Siri, take Siri, for example, um, until the Bus Service Act specified the location data needed to be provided in Siri, there was no obligation for anybody to provide it in that. But it was the de facto way of doing it because local authorities that had been by and operators that had been buying um, real time systems, location data systems had, had said, we want to use a standard so these things can talk to each other. Um, and so it had become the de facto standard. Um, Bus Service Act made it the legal standard. And so if you wanted to enforce some of the NetX stuff on stop data and thing like that, then that would need um, the NAPTAN team to work out how to enforce that on, on authorities. And I suspect they could do that through the Bus Service Act with the obligation for authorities to maintain NAPTAN. Right. So in the short term, you'd say no one really realistically could do anything with NetX and accessibility until the outcome of the future of the DFT project which was focused to look at, in particular, from how it was advertised, accessibility data within that chat. So it all hinges on that, you would, I infer from that, to whether it's in that chat or potentially goes somewhere else. 
Well, exactly. nothing to stop local authorities or suppliers supporting the standard, collecting the data and making it available. But if you wanted to mandate it, then that would need to come from the DFT. And on the assumption that we talked in the past in many places in meetings about accessibility data in it, it's unlikely well, nothing will happen locally until it's probably mandated, in my view. I don't know. John? Yeah, I, I'd be, be cautious about this because we don't know yet exactly how this government or any future government is going to deal with standards being outside the EU. And there have been some statements that if there's already a perfectly good standard, why invent another one? But there have also been some worrying statements that, oh, we won't have to bother about what Europe says anymore. Any UK manufacturer will be free to do, so long as it's safe, what they want to do. In other words, a sort of anarchy. Um, but isn't there a division here? How strong the BSI can be. Sorry, I, I, I think there's a big confusion here, though, because CERN is not an EU body. Um, um, Britain may have left the EU, but we haven't left CERN. Right. Ministers, yeah, ministers get confused yeah. about it because ministers think that it's Europe, therefore it's toxic. Well, it's not true. CEN is, is just a, you know, a munificent organisation that, that provides standards which you can buy into or not. And the BSI is still a member of CEN and is still publishing yeah. stand, CEN standards as they come out. Yeah. Very easy to make the mistake, but they're entirely separate constitutionally, legally, and every other possible way. We have no obligation to follow SEN. We never had, did have, but we did for the reasons described. And now we've enshrined certain things in law, and that's really good because it means that everyone has a level playing field. It's it's fairer and better. But to um, to kind of go, oh, it's it's the EU and we've left the EU, we, therefore we don't have to comply. Well, that's oh, we could do that in all sorts of things, but there's no point. I mean, it's 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 beneficial that we we otherwise it's much more expensive to create your own. That dare I say, Mike, that that we're in the realms of the rational versus the political. <laughs> um, and uh, you 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 know I I have a fear having seen Mr Pickles in action what a, an irrational politician may do. Um, yes, you're you're right. Hopefully everything would go um, in accordance with good professional opinion. But it's not unknown that good professional opinion has been ignored at senior political levels. Um, the other thing I think that it, it, it's worth saying is look at smart cards. You know, we have got it so basically because the Europeans, the Americans were not really interested in our problem that we had deregulation and therefore had to have a, an interoperability standard that uh, would cater for a multitude of different fair scales. Uh, but we've got it and it in fact is probably uh, offering something in fact to the Europeans now that they are beginning to have these issues. So I agree entirely with what you're saying Mike but I'm just just making the uh, the proviso that we will all at the end of the day be subject to whatever the appropriate minister lays down in his or her department and convinces the cabinet off. Yeah, um, so far the the track record of, of of what we have done through PTIC and Arctic and ATCO over the years in influencing what's ended up as SEN European and international standards has been quite good. Um, yeah. You know, if if you look at um, 
the whole public transport data scene, um, which is based on trans model that has largely been defined by UK people. Um, Siri was a combination of the early work of Artig and the German equivalent VDV. Yeah. Um, and yes, Europe is now looking at what we've done with it. So with an awful lot of interest um, and um, most of it so will end up turning into a European um, contactless smart card standard with probably any 20% change. Um, so very significant. And, and that's important from an industry point of view, because that means that suppliers that operate in the UK um, have a um, head start on being able to uh, to work in, in Europe and export, um, which is something that as a country we desperately need to be doing. Um, so, uh, but anyway, um, we can get too political here if we're not careful. Um, so um, is there anything um, else on EU standards development? No. OK, um, nobody has raised any issues with standards, so there's nothing new on the issues log unless somebody wants to jump in with a problem or a need to change anything that they've identified. No. OK, um, that then brings us to um, the next um, Mike. Can I can I just um, I should have mentioned it earlier in the Naptan section, but um, I, I saw Peter Stoner was on the call earlier, but I don't think he's I can't see him there now. Um, maybe Sarah will know the the Ito World Naptan viewer is still available, isn't it? Is that is that is it, is it going to be something to replace it when it goes? Yeah, this is a topic of uh, conversation at the moment, so it is still available at the moment and still will be until the summer at least. Um, yeah. And it is something that we are starting to put some plans in, in place to see if we can replace it and uh, understand the user base of the viewer really as well. OK, um, I remember last time Peter told me that I've got access to it, I've got a log into it, but he mm. told me there was a way of get if I want one of my colleagues to have access to it. The, 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 there doesn't seem to be an easy way of. He said you could just recommend them to it, or or, or click a link and get them added, get them sent a, a, a registration form. How, right. how 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 do you get someone else? How does someone get get access. to log into it? Yes. yes so sorry. no, yes. it's fine. We don't we don't manage the access to it here, to be honest. So I'm not 100% sure on that. But from my understanding, you can just click on as because I've, I've been on to view it so I can view it um, so I, I think you should be able to view it um, without an access without a login I thought there was a login needed to to be able to um, right browse. I'll think, uh, <clears throat> anyone else know has anyone else yes yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I can confirm with with Peter after the meeting but uh, I think oh, yes, previous, so. I've, I've gained access to it all I had to do was to email someone in the company and they, they sent me a username and password and it was very easy to do uh, and my, my understanding at the moment is that the the access to it is going to continue until the end of June this year uh, I, I can't say for certain what will happen after that but uh, as I say I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Peter and uh, confirm that yeah if you could because I've got a couple of well yeah. I've got a couple of internal colleagues and external colleagues who would benefit from using it yeah, that's, that's no problem. I'll I'll, uh, I'll find okay. out for you and thank get you. back. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that. You should. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So in terms of um, next meeting, um, if we meet in every three months, that would take us to uh, early June, um, unless there's a reason anybody knows we need to be meeting. Earlier than that, I'll talk to Theresa and we'll agree a date in early June. No, 
Okay. Um, in which case that takes us to any other business. John, you've got your hand up. Sorry, if it, if it's my hand, it's uh, an expired one. It's an expired one, right? Okay. <laughs> as long as it's just your hand that's expired. Okay. Um, is there anything from anybody? No. Okay. In which case, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Thank you for those that have contributed. I um, hope you've uh, learned things um, and uh, have a good rest of the day.